Hello and welcome to the Pots and Trials podcast with me, Martin Fish, joined as usual by Jill and Sean. Hi. Hello. Hi. And later on in this episode, we're going to be talking all things seeds. Yes, and also there'll be a listener's question, uh, well, a couple of listener's questions and some chat about tomatoes coming up later on. And apologies for my slightly croaky voice. I've come back from a wonderful weekend away with a terrible cold. So plenty of paracetamol down and I'll let Jill Martin do as much talking as he can get away with. (laughs) And we're going to be finding out what Martin's new bedtime reading is. Uh, But first, let's have a chat to Andrew Toakley from King's Seeds. So, Andrew, you are now the horticultural director at King Seeds and you've worked in horticulture all your life. So shall we start by just telling us a little bit about how you got into the industry and and how you got to where you are today? Right. Well, I was almost bred in captivity, if you like. I was born on a nursery. Um, My father was in the horticultural trade um, for many, many years and... um, he was general manager of a garden centre chain called Bypass Nurseries. And he used to run that. And at that time, they also used to grow some seed crops under glass as well, because they had a little nursery part on the side, grew their own bedding plants. So when I left school, I had to find um, a job. And I'd helped out on, at weekends, as you did when you were a child, helping out from parking cars to actual serving customers. And um, I decided then I'd go into horticulture. So I got a job with Bypass Nurseries um, and I was there for 11 years. And um, I went to Rittle College, um, got my City and Guilds um, at Rittle College. So i done that as a day release. So. I used to go on my day off to to actual Mm -hmm. Riddle College. Imagine (laughs) doing that nowadays. Um, Education, that is, isn't it? (laughs) So I used to go on my day off, done that for three years, got all my qualifications in the city and guilds. And I carried on working, as I say, at Bypass Nurseries. Started off in the garden centre, then moved to the nursery. And so I was growing bedding plants. Um, I was also involved in seed crops. We had sycamines for seed, um, primroses for seed. And as part of that work, we also used to grow seed trials for an American seed company. The seed company was called Bodger Seeds, not the best name for a seed company, but that's what it was called. So they used to send their seed over. We used to trial it for them in the UK, and then they'd come over and see how they performed both under glass and out in the field, we used to do this. So I got involved in that as well. And as a consequence of that, um, from a visit from local seed company, Thompson & Morgan, they approached me to go and grow trials for them. So I left Bypass Nurseries after 11 years, went and joined Thompson & Morgan, first of all, growing their trials and growing seed crops for them. Um, so we did that for a while. I then progressed into the office um, looking for new products, seed buying, and worked at Thompson & Morgan for 21 years. And then an opportunity came up at King Seeds um, for a seed buyer. I applied, but I said, I think I can offer you a little bit more on a seed buyer. Came here. I still buy all the seed, but now I'm horticultural director. A lovely journey you've had, and it's obviously, as you say, you've got horticulture and growing in your veins, haven't you? Really? So yeah, I mean, I've been in the horticultural industry over forty years now. Mm. Um, so, and what you learn, particularly in the seed industry, is it's all about connections. And I, you know, I know a lot of people in the trade, and it doesn't matter who you're working for, those connections travel through with you. Um, and by building up those relationships between suppliers and myself, that's how we get to look in the back of the greenhouse, if you like, to see some of the newer products that are coming along before they're released. And they trust you to come along and give you an opinion if you think it's worth of carrying on in their breeding. Um, and then eventually you offer it in your own catalogue. 
Yeah. And I suppose, uh, you know, as the buyer and the, the director of a seed company, you're always looking for something new for the catalogue, aren't you? You know, you, I know we, we see varieties in catalogues that have been there for as long as I can remember. And probably some of them are old Victorian varieties tried and tested. But there's always got to be some new varieties and new cultivars coming along. There has. What we try and do and what I've always tried to do is if we're introducing something new, it's not just because it's a new cabbage, new tomato. It's got to have a reason for adding it into the range. It's got to have a benefit or an improvement on something you're already offering. And I always say, if you look through RC catalogue, yes, there's a lot of old varieties in there that we'd never think of dropping because they're still very, very popular. But I always say to gardeners, well, you're growing that one, why don't you just try this new one as well? Mm. Um, because not only does it give you interest when you pop down the garden to see something new that you're growing, but you never know, that new variety may replace that old favourite you've had for years um, because it performs better. You know, it's a, there's a lot out there about old heritage varieties, you know, and they have the flavour and everything. Yeah, some of them do, but they don't have the disease resistance that some of the modern varieties have now, which is far better for the home gardener and you're going to get a far better result. Exactly, yes, you know, because we don't tend to spray as much or there aren't the chemicals there, even if you want to spray now. So if you can get uh, any plant that's got a natural resistance to disease, it's got to be for the good, hasn't it, really? It has, you know, club root resistant brassicas, for argument. So, you know, they're, they're a great example of where it's an improvement and a you know, where someone has ever had club root and not be able to grow their own brassicas anymore. Or if you've got club root resistant brassicas, it helps. Blight resistant tomatoes, another one. Um, so there's been developments over the years that really have helped both gardeners and growers, you know. So it's something like that, that um, the movement has come along in, in great leaps and bounds with breeding that um, people need to take on board really mm -hmm. now king's is a, an old established company as well so just tell people that probably don't know about king's you know where you are and just a little bit about the history of king's because you've been on the go a long time we have yeah so king's seeds have been going since 1888 and um, it was founded by our founder ew king and ew king had a great passion for sweet peas. He loves sweet peas. And if you're still looking at our catalogue today, we still offer a wide range of sweet peas. We still produce sweet peas here in Kelvedon in Essex, um, which is where we're from. Originally, we started out in Coggershaw, which is the next village just down the road. Um, but we moved to this site. And, you know, we still produce our own sweet peas, and that's what we're known for. But he also used to sell vaster ranges of seed elsewhere and over the years you know since the various changes within the company we're not a family-owned company but we're run like a family-owned company we're actually run, um, owned by little shareholders that all descend back to ew king so whether that was his, when he died he had no family so he left shares to a housekeeper and you know his gardener mm -hmm. and so all our shareholders are descendants from those descendants. So they have no active involvement within the company. They just um, come at once a year to a shares meeting to see that we've made <laughs> some money, really. But it's it's lovely because, you know, it's run like a family business, really. And that's what we thrive, you know, we pride ourselves on being good value and excellent quality customer service. And that's yeah. what the is built. And I think people still like those old fashioned family values, don't they? You're a company that they can trust at the end of the day. They are. And if they want to, you know, we always encourage people if they ever have a problem, they ring us up. They will be answered by a human being on the phone. They can be put through to myself or one of my colleagues, and we will speak to them, try and advise them. You know, we, we've done that for years and we. You know, you're not just going to have a recording or leave a message. You might do if you ring at lunchtime, but apart from that, you know, it's, <laughs> it can always get back to you um, and we'll always um, speak to you.
That is lovely to think that when you do ring up, you are going to speak to uh, to a human being. I love that idea because it's oh, so frustrating, isn't it, when you get an answer phone or a message or something. It's rare these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it is. But I want to know what they're having for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> They all obviously have lunch together, which is great, isn't it? They probably all have the finest grown vegetables. I would you know, hope so. Every day, yeah. fresh vegetables. And fresh fruit salad. Yes. Oh, I'm, wonderful. I'm a do, they, do they have some trial grounds? I know Andrew grows a lot on his allotment, but do they have trial grounds? I don't know to what extent they are. I mean, I know certainly they grow a lot of sweet peas at their headquarters Mm. down in Essex. I mean, I think it's more or less a field of sweet peas um, in front of the offices. It looks like the office is in the middle of a field of sweet peas. And I'm sure they grow other things there as well. I mean, we will find out because we've been invited down in the summer Mm. to go and have a look anyway. That would be great. Although the sweet peas will be finished, I think, by the time we get down there. Well, you don't know. Andrew's going to let us know. Well, I'm hoping there'll be a Pots and Trials video in that as well. Oh, um, definitely. Yes. You know, we'll be able to show the, yes. the listeners as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, yeah. that that's absolutely what we want to go for, to see what they're up to. Yes, definitely. And the, and the new seeds that they're introducing, um, it's great that Andrew was saying that they're not just doing it because they're new, uh, but there's always a reason for doing it. So it's going to be new, improved. It's going to be more blight resistant. Um, you know, the, there are always going to be some improvements. Mm. I mean, you are a bit old fashioned in your habits of, of buying seed, aren't you? You'll tend to go for the same varieties. So this is maybe good. You know, you might broaden your horizons a little yeah, bit. Martin, no, no, just... I think you're being a little bit harsh on me there, <laughs> Mrs. Fish. I, I do like some oh. tried and tested varieties. I mean, like I like Musselboro as a leek. It's a really good tried and tested one so yes i do and the sutton um you know broad bean is a good one been around forever a lot of these old varieties some of them go back to the victorian and edwardian era so they are tried and tested but i will always try some of the hybrids um you know i think with tomatoes and things like when we grow the butternut squashes and sweet corn then the newer breeding is very good because it's got the vigour in there. And more importantly, I think it is the disease resistance because, yes. you know, nobody sprays as much anymore. There aren't the chemicals available, uh, even if you wanted to. So, you know, commercial breeders are trying to get plants that have got natural disease resistance. And that's got to be a good thing. Yeah. And heritage tomatoes came came in, into fashion, really, again. Didn't I know they'd been there already, but, mm. but a lot of the companies were bringing back heritage tomatoes. And we grew a, two or three different varieties yeah and some of them we just thought they're really not as tasty yeah we did a lot because there used to be a nursery when there where we lived that That's grew right. heritage yeah. tomatoes and they supplied us with quite a few plants to try i'm going back sort of 10 12 mm. years ago and some of them were very good but some mm. of them i wouldn't have grown again they were they looked interesting but yes. they just didn't have the flavor and i think no. that's the worry sometimes we hang on to things because they're old but they're not necessarily good well and it's quite and, trendy and... looking at me <laughs> <laughs> it's quite trendy in restaurants now to have a, a bowl of heritage tomatoes with dressing you know you very often you'll get that as a side dish or as a starter and you think yeah there are lots of different colors because there's black ones yellow ones stripy ones mm. all sorts aren't there but are they necessarily as tasty? It's the way you grow them. And the, the main thing we always say with tomatoes, it's when you pick them, isn't it? Because you're growing them and you can go in there to the greenhouse and pick them when yeah. they're perfectly ripe and ready. That, that's exactly that's true. I mean, that, that's the difference between homegrown tomatoes and supermarket yeah. tomatoes because they pick them before they're ripe. Yeah. They have to do because they've got to be transported, washed, graded, packaged, moved around the world. Um, whereas you go into your greenhouse and you select the tomatoes that are fully ripe and that's when they yeah. get the best flavour. Yeah, I mean, um, I bought some tomatoes, a pack of tomatoes the other day and they were like bullets and had no taste at no. all. Most of the supermarket tomatoes that we have are terrible. Is that the variety or is there an element of yeah. where it's ripening that is important? If it's ripening on the vine, on the, you know, on the plant, is that a, a huge amount different to ripening in a box, for instance? Mm, it is. I think that that full flavour you get in the last sort of week or so of growth, you know, yeah. all the, the sweetness or the acidity, that really juiciness is in there. And you lose a lot of that if you pick them under ripe and then they ripen sort of in transit or, you know, when you get them home. I mean, the, the, the commercial ones, we, we mustn't knock them at all. They are good varieties. And if you grow that same variety at home, it will always taste so much better. Shortly, we're going to hear about a new variety of tomato called the toddler, which sounds really intriguing. But it's interesting that also just just to rewind a bit. And, you know, we've talked about kind of, you know, 
sticking to the same old tried and tested varieties. But Andrew's suggesting that, you know, if you're growing a row of one variety and maybe you could grow a second row next to it of, of one of the other or the mm. newer varieties and just see how, how it compares, really. So that's that's something anybody can really yeah. do if you've got a bit of space. Yeah, and it is. And, and very often, you know, a different variety will extend the cropping season. You know, some of them have a, you know, um, let's think of a good example would be something like leeks. Some leeks are early in the season, some are later in the season. So often by growing a couple of different varieties, you can really extend the period that you're going to be harvesting your fresh produce. And if you've got a question about produce and about growing your own uh, food, obviously you can just drop us an um, email. Martin will answer uh, on the podcast. So if you just send us an email to info at potsandtrowels.com, that's info at potsandtrowels.com. Um, all the links are in the show notes or the uh, video descriptions if you're watching any of our videos. And um, Martin will answer it. I'll do my very best to answer <laughs> all your questions. Well, we have got a question later on in the podcast. Um, but for now, let's go back to uh, to our chat with Andrew. Now, we're coming up to a really busy time of the year for seed sowing, Andrew, and, uh, you know, people will be getting their seed orders in and no doubt you're inundated at the moment. So, you know, you are uh, flowers and uh, vegetables. So, you know, what sort of split do you have within the company? Is it equal or is vegetables still the main side for you? Vegetables is our main side, um, purely because um, King's is also the National Allotments approved brand. So we we supply all the national allotment societies around the country um, with seed. So they they have their own catalogue from us, and we take all their orders. So we're very key on vegetables, but we also have a nice flower range as well. But that that's the biggest split. It's probably around sixty percent veg to forty percent flowers. Okay, and and you know, thinking back a few years ago when we had the the pandemic, COVID, lots of people started gardening that probably never grown before you know they're all buying packets of veg seed and flower seeds because they've got nothing else to do has that stayed there you know are still people growing or have they dropped off there's a little bit of a drop off um because obviously there were some people as you say they thought bless them they thought they could sow a tomato today and they'd be picking it in three weeks time you know it's uh, because they hadn't ever grown one but there are a certain amount that have stuck with it. Um, so the sales are not as high as when it was in COVID, um, which, you know, in some ways is good because it was very difficult to cope with the amount of orders that we were getting and the seed supply around the world was was the same, having trouble, trouble coping with it. But we're still very good on sales. We've still got better sales now than we had two years ago when we were still coming out of the pandemic. So um so we've kept a lot of those customers yeah and, and that's encouraging that a lot of those people that you know started gardening that had never done it before have stayed with it um i mean we don't know what the age profile is i mean is is it still an, an older generation growing seed or are you finding lots of younger people having a go growing seed as well it's very mixed to be it to be fair and i would say um if you went onto my own allotment site i would say we've got a higher percentage now of families or plots that are owned by the the wife of the family rather than the husband which it used to be so mm. there's quite a quite a split there yeah well, that, well that's good again that you know because that the fact if the family are down on the allotment that's going to get the children involved and that's the next yeah. generation of gardeners which is how it used to be years ago of course it is i mean and that's to me that's where people learn gardening you know if you're down there you, you actually playing with it or you're like you say I learned from my father he learned from his father so it's you know you you're passing it on I mean I've got a young well I had a young family they're all growing up now but I had my son with me when he was around six seven years old he was up on the allotment sowing and planting he still remembers it he doesn't want to do it now mm -hmm. uh, so much but he will probably when you know he's trying to develop his own garden and, and that sort of thing so it's um it's something i think that stays with you if you do start it very young 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I've, I've got three grown-up children um, and, it, and it's a bit of a cliche, but I think you've sown the seed when they're young yeah. and as they're getting older, they're all in the 30s, they are now, they've got their own houses and they're starting to think, yeah, we, we know a little bit about gardening because we saw Dad doing it all those years ago. So that's yeah. good, it just sows the seed. Now, y- you have mentioned your allotment and I know you are you are very much a grower. You're, you, know, you, you grow some amazing veg. So I suppose that's quite good when you're, choosing and selecting new seeds to put in the catalogue because you know exactly how they're going to grow how they're going to perform so any new introductions that you just want to mention to us that are in this year's catalogue that might be worth people looking out for and trying yeah. Name well, there's in. one which is um, a new tomato called toddler mm. and toddler is an indoor tomato although you can grow it outside um, it's got good blight resistance but the main thing with toddler is it was bred, so it's it's a hybrid variety and fantastic flavour, really heavy cropper. And I believe, from when I've tested it and when I've tasted it as well, this will become the improved Gardener's Delight. Because Gardener's Delight is still very, very popular, mm. but it's an open pollinated variety, got no blight resistance. So this is a hybrid, but it's got blight resistance, good flavour, very good yield, a fruit of a very similar size, and I think a better flavour than Gardener's Delight. Well, that's interesting, because yes, I mean, yeah. years and years ago, Gardener's Blight was the go-to red cherry tomato for everybody, wasn't right. it? And, and you, you've heard people saying, oh, it's not as good as it used to be, because I suppose the strain weakens over the years, but this sounds like a really, really good replacement. Yeah, so it's it's something that I saw in trials. I trialled it for a year myself um, before we introduced it to make sure it was as good as I thought it was. Um, and it really has performed well. Really good cropper, as I say, and the flavour is excellent. Um, okay. And it's an attractive looking cherry as well. So, And this year what we've done is we've actually put it in the catalogue at a trial price of only um, 75 pence. So we have a smaller seed count, just so people can try it. And what we're saying, try it against what you've always grown, just mm. so you can then see if that does improve and give us some feedback. 75p, it's a bargain, isn't it, really? You can't yes. go wrong with that one. So, yeah. So on your allotment then, um, because you obviously... Your day job is is at King Seeds. You you know you're doing all the yeah. ordering. You're 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 the technical man when it comes to horticulture there, Andrew. So when you're on your allotment, you know what sort of things do you grow on your allotment? Uh, a vast amount, um, various crops from runner beans and as you all do, um, a, a wide range of crops. I do like growing onions and leeks, which I have grown and I exhibit in the local show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, the allotment that I have, um, I've had for, I think I've had it now probably 15 years, the one which I'm on at the moment. I had a other allotment before that, before I moved house. But the great thing about the site where I am, which I'm in Cape of St Mary, is in Suffolk, um, my allotment. And um, I trial a lot of the new products on there as well before we introduce them. So it gives us an early insight. Um, but... I'm also known for a very neat allotment. <laughs> I've actually won the best kept allotment for the last six, well, I've won it six times out of the last seven years. So um, I'm a great one for straight paths and neat edges and, and making it look nice. But um, yeah. it's a practical allotment. And if you keep it clean from the start, and um, I'm not up there every minute of the day because I'm at work, you know, and... Um, so I just go up there at the weekends, spend a couple of hours going through, and people say, why are you hoeing? There aren't any weeds. I say, well, that's the time to hoe. <laughs> because then you don't get them. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> so, yes. No point doing it when they're four inches tall, is exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Thing. I remember when my son was up there, and I used to say, well, right now we've got to knock our footprints out. And he said, well, why are we knocking the footprints out? I said, well, one, that will help. Look, make it look tidy and two I can see if anybody else has walked on the allotment um, but it's you know it's it's those things and I've always done it that way even when I had a little plot at home I always used to like to keep it nice and tidy but yeah I grow a wide range of vegetables um, probably my favourite vegetable to grow are onions and leeks 
But my favourite vegetables to eat are runner beans and sprouting broccoli. Yeah, yeah, all good ones. And and of course, we're coming to the time of the year when it it's still early for most seed sowing, but we can be starting to sow the tomatoes and the peppers and the, the indoor. And then in a, within a month, we can start to sow all the outdoor veg as well, can't we? So perfect oh. time to get started. Yeah, I mean, so, like you say, so all your indoor, your greenhouse things like tomatoes, peppers, certainly peppers and chilies and aubergines that take a long, long growing period. You should be sowing those certainly soon. Get into February, towards the mid end of February, I'll start to sow a few of the brassicas, you know, things like Brussels sprouts I'll be sowing then, which you think probably you're only just finishing those, but they do need a long growing period mm. to be ready for Christmas. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're looking forward to working with you because you very kindly agreed to work with us on the Pots and Trials videos through the spring. So uh, I'm going to be trying some of the seeds. Certainly Toddler is one that I've already got on my list anyway. So you've just confirmed that that's one definitely worth growing, Andrew. So looking forward to trying that. Um, how can people, I mean, you've told us you're based in Essex. Um, you've got a website, presumably. How can people find out a bit more if they if they haven't been buying seeds from you and want to give you a go? Because it is an amazing catalogue. And the, the great thing I love about your catalogue um, is that not only do you give the sort of cultural information on each one, a bit of info about it, but there's lots of general information and tips on growing each of the vegetables. So it's a bit like a mini textbook as well. It is. I mean, a lot of people um, say, well, I, I like to look them through the catalogue and they do. They read it so that they get the growing information at the start of each section as well as um, about each variety. Um, but if anybody wants a catalogue yet, there's, um, they can either order it through the website, which is all the W's, kingseeds.com, or they can call us on 01376 570000. And you regularly post on Facebook and Twitter as well, don't you? So people can you follow do. you on, on socials as well. Andrew, it's been great having a catch up with you. Um, I need to start looking through this catalogue again and compile a list of things that I'm <laughs> going to grow in the garden this year. I don't know if I could compete with you, though. On the Although I must admit, many, many years ago, when I was probably only in my 20s, I had an uncle. He was a coal miner and his hobby was growing onions. Um, and this is going back a long way. And in those days, if they were growing an onion, to put into a local show that was three pounds they were doing really really well of course nowadays i think the, the onion record's about 19 pounds or something like that but uh, i did have a, a year or two putting things into little shows onions and carrots and i must admit i quite enjoyed doing that because there's a great satisfaction of presenting something that is perfect on a show bench there is and, and it's um a great way of um meeting fellow gardeners and a lot of people say there's a lot of rivalry, but there's a lot of friendship there as well. I mean, we I swap plants and seeds with fellow competitors. Um, you know, we we do, and uh, you know, it's whoever grows it the best or um, exhibits it the best, you know, wins the prize. And um, I mean, I've, in the past, I've grown exhibition chrysanthemums and all sorts, so dahlias and that sort of thing. So it's uh, it's it's great fun. Um, you have to be very dedicated and have lots of time. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for giving up some time to chat to us today. I know I know you're a busy man and we're looking forward to later on in the summer. We're going to hopefully come down and see you down there in Essex and, and have a look at what you're doing at King Seeds. You're welcome. Well, this toddler is uh, really intriguing, but, you know, if toddlers kind of like in my mind, are the ones that fall over all the time, right? So is this a falling, tumbling tom or is this a, a bush tomato? Or what's the deal? Do we know? Yeah, we do. Yes. I mean, it, well, it's not a bush tomato and it's not a uh, trailing tomato, a tumbling one. It's actually an upright tomato. So this is one that you would grow, tie it to a cane and you would remove the side shoots to get that single stem and then the trusses with these lovely red cherry tomatoes. And it, it's one I'm definitely going to grow. Um, mm. We're going to get some seed. In fact, the, the, the seed has arrived. <gasps> we can honestly say now the seed has arrived since I it spoke to so, Andrew. You were so excited, oh, weren't so you? Excited. We've got this big box <clears throat> and it had a king's wrapper all See, around delivery. the outside and it was just oh you just stopped everything didn't you <laughs> i did yes i just sat and sorted <laughs> seats to do one of those youtube unboxing videos uh, exactly <laughs> yeah. yes yeah. that's right well you can see 
the seeds being unpacked in our latest <laughs> Pots and Trials video that's out now because uh, we're going to be sowing some seeds of broad beans and, and showing you the seeds that we've got and giving you some tips how to keep you them. You just sat and played with your packets of seeds for quite a while I in did, the greenhouse. I did. You're a very happy bunny. And I have to say, the catalogue, I mean, it is a very interesting catalogue. That's your new bedtime reading, isn't it? <laughs> you take that to bed with you and thumb through the pages. Yeah, enjoy. Well, you... How do you sleep, Martin? How do you sleep? Well, you can always learn something new from reading a good seed catalogue. <laughs> you can and when I when I sow the seeds of these Sean I'm going to sow uh, the ones for the greenhouse in a couple of weeks time I will sow some slightly later I'll, I won't sow all the packet in one go because then I'll do some for you because I know you've not got a greenhouse so you can grow that if you've got somewhere yes. warm yeah, and sunny a sheltered wall I think they're worth having a go yeah. outside with them yeah they sound delicious mm. right now we yeah. have oh, got yeah, a we'll, couple of questions we'll give them a go, yeah, we've give got a couple go. of questions from the same listener and I unfortunately haven't written her name down can you remember who it uh, was that sent this is them? Louise Louise, Louise. Hi, Louise. Um, and she's got two questions. One of them is about her daughter's garden. So she's got a new build house with a smallish back garden, which faces northwest. And she wants to make a bit of a garden there. It's just a lawn at the moment, I'm guessing. Uh, so have you got any tips with planning where to start? And she would like a colourful border. OK, uh I mean, I think the fact that it's northwest, I wouldn't let that worry you at all. Uh, it's going to get that late afternoon uh, sunshine in there. So that'd be quite nice to sit out of an evening. It's just a lawn at the moment, a square lawn with a fence around it. And it looks like a tool store in the top left hand corner. So I would certainly put some borders around. You want to hide those fences. Depends if you want a lawn or not. Uh, if, you, if you don't want a lawn, then it sky's the limit. But I would work with borders. But put... put Borders in that are reasonably deep. Don't just put a, a border in that's sort of a foot deep, 30 centimetres. Go, you know, a metre deep and then you can get different layers of plants. And what I would aim for initially is something that's going to be there all year round. So I'd go for some shrubs and just go to a garden centre, get a selection of evergreens, deciduous. So you've got a backdrop. Would you put some curves in there, Mark, for those borders? You could do. It depends if you're a curvy person or straight. I mean, you could certainly round the corners. And what you could do, if you if you were clever with it, you could plant something in front of the, the storage box, just make a little pathway, a few stepping stones to it, an evergreen in front of that, that would hide that as well. Uh, and just, you know, your eye would be drawn to a lovely shrub. But if you've got a mixture of a few evergreens and a few sort of summer flowering shrubs in there, and then you can fill in between with some of the lovely perennials that you get in the summer, some bulbs. So I would, you know, try to make it an all year round garden that's easy to maintain, but it will look lovely when you look from the upstairs window and the house windows and give you a little area to sit. Mm. Good starting point. And then she can always develop that. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the future, can't she, yes. as well, and, and sort of make make other borders as well. But I think the thing is, don't rush out and buy all your plants in one go, because the garden centres will have plants there at the moment that will only be winter. Yeah, sorry, so, I'm just looking at you, because we've got a whole selection of plants ready to go into our garden. <laughs> we've done the borders, but um, that's a whole other... Don't, don't do what he does, <laughs> well, no, do but what that's, he yeah. that's because I've been buying them we've over the season. We've been collecting them for, for about four years. And I've got plants that will look good all year round when they go in the garden. Right. Second question is about grandma's garden. So we're multi-generational here on Pots and Travels, aren't we? Excellent. So grandma's garden is west facing. Um, it's very well matured. She's lived there for over 60 years. Um, and she's planted a small plum tree about 15 years ago. It was very slow to start. But over the last few years, she's had some good crops. Uh, but last season, there was very little fruit and the leaves curled. And she, Louise did send us a picture of the leaves. Mm -hmm. Um, any suggestions as to what's gone wrong, how to improve it for this year? Um, Louise did trim it back around the end of October, cutting off the worst of the curl on the leaf. OK, right. Well, it's it's a very common problem and it's a very clear photograph as well, Louise. Thank you. It's a problem called leaf curl aphid and it, it you get it on apples, you get it on plums, you get it on cherries. And it's a little this in this case, the one that goes on plums and cherries is a black aphid, which sucks the sap out the leaf. And it's a very clever little aphid because as it sucks the sap from the underside of the leaf, the leaf curls and looks distorted. And the aphids are hidden away in there, so birds and other predators can't get them. So it's a, almost a natural self-defence for them. And they just feed quite happily. So although it looks really bad on the tree, it doesn't do an awful lot of harm to it. It can weaken it a little bit. So what you need to do is pick all those leaves up when they fall off. Very often you'll get a flush of new growth later in the season 
which isn't affected so the tree will recover um, there's not an awful lot you, do, you can do because spraying is really difficult even if you want to because the aphids are hidden away in that curled leaf but what you can do at this time of the year while the tree is totally dormant and I would say do it before sort of mid or late February at the latest when the buds are tight you can get what you call a winter wash and go to a garden center and it's a winter wash that you spray on the tree when it's bare of leaf and that will kill any of the eggs that are in the little the nooks and crannies and it will help a little bit um, but it, it may come back next year and it's something you might have to live with um, but that's what it is just look up leaf curl aphid. and will that have affected the fruit or it, was it just a bad it year it might i don't think it was a good year last no. year for plums a lot of people we haven't got a and plum apples. tree at the minute but it was i think because of the weather so hopefully this year you'll get more I'm absolutely listening to this avidly because I've had a problem with a young apple sapling that's had this. And I've asked you about it before, but what I didn't realise was how it comes back mm. each season. So this winter wash is on my list of things to get. I've just written it down. <laughs> yeah. I'll be off out to get one. Yeah, of those. and, and they, are, they do work. I mean, they, they won't get rid of everything, but it will get rid of some of them. It will reduce the problem uh, next year for you. And they, they're organic ones as well, so you're not spraying on any nasty chemicals. Okay, so that's a job. Any more jobs yeah, there's just Well, we've had a few inquiries... I noticed on the YouTube um, about a video that we did a while ago on uh, hydrangeas and there's been a few people just asking when to prune hydrangea macrophylla which is the big mop head hydrangea right. the one that flowers late summer um, and uh, the time to prune it if you're in England this is uh, obviously if you're in Australia New Zealand Southern Hemisphere it's different but if you're if you're pruning it in, uh, at this in this country the time to do it would be a little bit later than now I'd say I'd wait into March when the worst of the weather's gone you've got those big fat buds at the top and what you do is cut down the old flower head the stem down to some of the big fat buds below it and they will then form the new shoots and they will flower for you later on this year. So hold back for a, another month at least. You did said the mop head ones, but that's not the Annabelle type no, one. No, the Annabelle is one that you prune hard. Macrophylla is the, the sort of traditional one people think of, the pinks and the blues yeah. that make a lovely dome shape one. So yes, yeah, so wait another month before you get the secretaires out okay. and then you can prune it. Mm. And fantastic. And if you have got a question for Martin on anything that's happening in your garden, do drop us an email, info at potsandtrials.com, and we'll answer it on the podcast. New podcast comes out every Sunday morning. Well, UK time, depends where you are in the world, as, as we just said, you know. If it might be Saturday night somewhere. somewhere. Be, <laughs> Don't even try to work that one out, Sean. But yes. I'll tell you what, it's 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 five o'clock yeah. somewhere. <laughs> it is. Yes. Well, thanks for listening and bearing with me, particularly with my throaty... Raspy voice uh, this week. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be doing some stuff on snowdrops, mm -hmm. which is very exciting on the podcast. Um, remember, we've got videos out every Thursday. The one you can watch at the moment is King's Seed. So if you've enjoyed this chat with Andrew, then you can see Martin opening his big box of King's Seeds on the <laughs> latest video. So, we'll, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>